welcome everyone to the last fast pitch session of this RPE Summit. A uh, quick correction to the schedule. Unfortunately, our colleague Lakshana Hadar will not be joining us. However, you can look forward to seeing her fast pitch posted when we share all of these online. My name is Addison Stark, and I am here today to start, also start off and give you uh, my fast pitch once it comes up on the screen. Already went too far. Good morning. <laughs> my name is Addison Stark. I'm a fellow with RPE. And one of the things I've been looking at over the past few months is really looking at ways we can leverage some of the recent developments in advanced manufacturing to rethink how we approach the design of chemical reactors. So when you look at a chemical plant today, what you see is a very large, engineered for purpose, city-scale infrastructure project. It's a, a really, and when you look at it, what you see is reactors that look like pipes connected to other separation systems that also are structured after pipes, and many pipes connecting them. It's truly a series of tubes, as some might call it. And the reason we do this is because of traditional design heuristics that uh, chemical engineering has been using for the past 100 years. Uh, really, it's because if we look at why do we do this, uh, we try and go larger. And when we go larger, the reason we're doing this is because as you increase the size of a plant, you are able to achieve cost reductions due to economies of scale. And this is something that's been well observed, and if you look at this data for GTL plants that have been built over the past decades, we see a good, strong downward trend. And this is because of the design heuristic that tells us we want to minimize cost over the total amount of material that we, that we process. And this largely gives us scaling, which is the surface area, which is the cost, the total amount of material over the volume, how much we can put through the chemical reactor. If we do a little bit of geometry, we quickly find that the cost over the plant size scales is something one over the characteristic length or the radius of the reactor. So therefore, it gives us the so-called immutable law of bigger is always better. However, we have a problem with this. If we look back at the plot on the right, we quickly see that some of the more recent larger plants that we build are off, off of the expected cost curve. And since this is a log-log plot, we realize that this isn't just minor cost overruns. This is associated with billions of dollars of, of oh, too expensive capital. There is another way we can approach this. There are other ways for us to convert barrels of, of oil per day or, or make them, and that is the internal combustion engine. So if you look at about 350 horsepower engine, this is roughly, if you run it nonstop, a one barrel per day gasoline conversion machine. And so if you plot, if you were to take a guess on where this, the value of the cost of this is, it's also way off the curve, but it's way down here. It's, it's on the order of thousands of dollars per, per um, barrel per day. And the reason for that is because we make a lot of them. We've learned over time that as you manufacture, you get a different type of, of economy of scale, economy of manufacturing scale. By making hundreds of thousands of these per year, we are quickly able to learn and decrease the total cost of, of the things we produce. So what I want to talk about today is what, what we really see is, I see even, as economic and technical opportunity by rethinking how we approach the chemical reactor. So what I want us to do is re-engineer the chemical reactor from the ground up. A new paradigm that I want to put out for you is the idea of bringing three things together, additive manufacturing, computational design methods, and multi-scale modeling and to develop what I would call a simulation in the loop design methodology, where we're able to take advantage of modern computational power and the tools that we previously didn't have to, to build objects in geometries and topologies that were previously inaccessible, and to be able to design and build things that no longer sit on the traditional scaling. So what I'm going to talk about right now, while there are plenty of examples of interesting opportunities in these other two spaces, is computational design methods that are able to design for additive. So traditionally, if you're going to build a chemical reactor, you would 
go ahead and pick one or two parameters, the diameter, the length of the reactor, and go ahead and optimize it. And what you see quickly is you're very limited in the number of parameters you can use, and relatively you're not changing fundamentally what it looks like. You can make it bigger and smaller. Now there are other tools you can use or you can start to get fancy and bend the sides, bend surfaces, add some sort of curvature, but still you're just adding a couple of more parameters. How if you go ahead and take a, a blank black box approach where you just say you want to flow in and a flow out, you can really start to use a tool called topology optimization where just by giving the opt by setting up an optimization problem, you start to hopefully see new features that you otherwise wouldn't approach or intuit with your own design heuristics. And I want to give an example of that. So topology optimization came out of the world of structural materials, of civil engineering, and it was really being able to solve the problem. I want to build a structure with a certain performance by min and minimize cost or minimize the total amount of material I put in. So for example, if you want to design a bridge, say, that is able to hold a certain amount of force in the middle, uh, you can go ahead and discretize that and then run such a simulation, and you find that without any sort of uh, initial conditions or priming, you are able to recover the traditional truss structure used in civil engineering. Now this is one of these things where I would say, yeah, my, my heuristics, my design intuition would tell me we can do that. Um, however, once you start to add more complex physics, say adding Navier-Stokes, and you want to build something like a fluidic valve or a, pa a passive valve, a fluidic diode, where the design problem looks like in one, you want to maximize flow resistance in one direction and minimize in the other, and you go ahead and solve your Navier-Stokes, you start to find you get very complex geometries and topologies and connectivities that I would argue that your intuition would not have brought you to. And so what you see then is, and what you find are these very complex structures and it's really allowing for minimal pathways forward and maximum pathways or long tortuous path in return. And you're finding that performances are four to five times better than traditional designs, the Tesla valve. So what I want to ask for people to give me information on is what other opportunities you see in this space. Obviously, I see opportunity in computational design. However, I'm beyond that, I'm curious about opportunities in printed composites, novel materials, and other sorts of ways to integrate complex multi-materials for controls inside of the chemical reactor. And so I'm looking forward to taking questions from everyone later. However, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and off, hand off to my colleague, uh, Rachel Slaybaugh. Oh, I already went too far, same problem. <laughs> Good morning. So nuclear energy has a lot to offer. However, some of you might be familiar with the concept that nuclear technology development can sometimes be a little slow and a little expensive. For example, qualifying a new fuel for a nuclear reactor might take 14 unique steps over 23 years. And that's not <laughs> ideal when we want to bring new technologies into the world. And so the question I'm thinking about is, could that be different? And so I'm here to talk to you today about making nuclear technology development harder, better, faster, stronger. And for those of you who have never heard of Daft Punk, you should look that song up. <laughs> nuclear technology really could contribute a lot um, to the future of our uh, clean energy emissions. So right now, eight and a half quads of electricity come from nuclear energy. As we move to an electrified vehicle fleet and a deeply decarbonized economy, that potential grows tremendously. So today, 90 quads of electricity, transportation, and um, industrial process heat is what's required in the United States. And, and that's just here. Globally, in a business as usual scenario growth prediction for nuclear, there's a $740 billion market over the next 10 years. So there's a lot of trade space there to operate in that's really interesting, and it turns out there are more than 50 startup companies in the United States that are interested in going after that space. But for us to really capitalize on the potential that's available, we've got to figure out how to develop nuclear technologies that we need for the future quickly and effectively. Because for these reactors, these advanced reactors to become reality, we need robust operation conditions, we need durable materials, and we need efficient operating strategies. Even if we want to keep the existing fleet online, these are needed. 
So the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is mostly in the context of nuclear materials, um, but the ideas fundamentally extrapolate to a lot of different areas. Materials are just the easiest to talk about. And so when we think about nuclear materials, some of the issues that come up in nuclear reactors are neutron damage. So we have one to two and a half MeV neutrons that are usually the culprits. They come in, they displace atoms, and they create interstitials and vacancies. The more that that happens, the less well the materials hold up and they degrade over time and lose performance capability. That's compounded when you have higher temperatures and corrosive environments. So more damage equals more materials problems. Well, what kind of scale are we talking about? So this is a plot of the temperature ranges that the reactors we're talking about exist over versus material damage. So in the lower left, that little green bar that says generations two and three, that's existing reactors and we're getting more damage as we extend the lifetimes of those reactors. But you can see that the collection of reactors that we're talking about have many much higher temperatures and much larger amounts of damage. And some of them have highly corrosive environments like liquid lead reactors and molten salt reactors. So if we're really serious about these technologies, we need to figure out how to develop the materials that are required to make them successful. And what, what kinds of material, like what are we solving with these materials? There's a collection of things that are interesting. Um, for example, accident tolerant fuels. Um, this is a uranium zirconium alloy that can go in existing reactors to make them more robust, operationally safer, and more cost effective. There are layered silicon carbide composite claddings that are also available for accident tolerance in the existing fleet or advanced reactors. As we look at reactors that can consume waste and have very high safety characteristics. Some of them require molten salts as coolants or fuel eutectics. Um, we also have advanced reactors that take these tiny little fuel kernels. This is a half millimeter diameter uranium oxide pellet uh, surrounded by absorptive and durable coatings. So each of these types of materials requires a different amount of additional development to be available for use. And all of them can make reactors more robust, more efficient, safer and more economical. And unfortunately, the story's not great. How do we actually do that? There aren't very many facilities in the world that can provide the neutrons of the type and, vol and number that we need to do testing. Um, of those facilities, they aren't always available. They don't operate 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Many of them have limited spaces for test samples. Samples are limited in size. And they also vary in operational conditions. So when we have multi-year testing, there's a lot of variation in the conditions that introduce uncertainties in the measurements that we then have to correct for. And the less familiar we are with the technology, the more time it takes and the more it costs. And so the question becomes, can we make new nuclear technology development cost-effective and time-relevant? And obviously I'm here talking about this with you because I think maybe we can, and I want your input on that. So here's my big dream. What if we change how we do experiments? So I wanna qualify vibranium for use as a structural material in a nuclear reactor. So right now, maybe I can put three samples in at one time, but what if I could put in 30? Right now, I maybe have to put that in an experimental facility for 10 years, but what if it could be 10 months? Right now, that might cost $10 million by the time you do the experiment and processing, but what if it could cost $10,000? Right now, I'm stuck with the operational conditions of the facility that I then have to correct for and try to back out. But what if I knew those operational conditions and I even could tune them to exactly the test I wanted them to be? One of the other challenges is right now, I have to have sample sizes that are large enough that when I'm measuring, I'm confident I'm getting bulk material behavior. So that's sort of five to 10 crystals in a material structure. Um, but what if I could use very small samples and I had the ideas about how that worked so that I could take you know, two crystals and map that to bulk material behavior. So if you look at now and the, the dream, it really is a game changer. And it might sound like, oh, what, that's a lot that has to happen, but it turns out there are a lot of really viable ideas right now that could make nuclear technology development harder, better, faster, stronger. So some of those ideas are leveraging proxies and surrogates to avoid slow and low access experiments. Um, one of the controversial discussions in nuclear energy right now is using ion irradiation instead of neutron irradiation. So ions, way easier to access, much cheaper, much quicker, but there are fundamental questions about how representative are they? Do we need to have corrections? How much can we supplant neutron testing with ion testing? 
We're also thinking about can you parallelize experiments? Can you use additive manufacturing to make a sample that internally has a bunch of small sample variations so you're testing a multitude of conditions at one time? That has questions about how do you manufacture it? How far apart do those samples need to be to avoid drift effects? And then as advanced sensoring becomes more sophisticated, are there sensors that we could put in the experiment so that we get more online data so that we can process things as we go? And if we need to tweak the experiment, we can do that. And then finally, can we improve the models of how very physically small experiments quantitatively map to bulk material properties so that then we can expose samples for a much shorter amount of time and we can get many more experiments at one time? So there are a lot of really interesting and really tough scientific challenges in here, but these are all areas that people are starting to talk about. And I think if we bring them together collectively, we really can think about making nuclear technology development harder, better, faster, stronger. Thank you so much for your attention. And next I'd like to introduce Fadl. He's one of our fantastic fellows at RPE. Thanks, Rachel. <coughs> Hi everyone, before I actually begin, I wanna remind you all that you can text any questions you have, hopefully the slide will come back on, thank you, uh, to 22333, um, it's all right there, you know the drill. We will be taking questions from your, um, from what you send us right after we finish these slides. So, perfect. As Rachel said, my name is Farah Sari. I'm a fellow at RPE. And today I want to talk to you about taking a leaf out of nature's book, finding ways to apply insights from biological systems to industrial catalysts. So before I joined RPE as a fellow, I was a researcher in the field of heterogeneous catalysis, and more specifically electrochemical heterogeneous catalysis. And I love heterogeneous catalysts. Heterogeneous catalysts are catalysts that exist in a different state than the reactant, so usually that means that the catalyst is a solid and the reactants are liquids or gases. And the vast majority of catalysts used in industrial reactions are heterogeneous catalysts, and that's because they often have many advantages, including the ability to operate at high pressures, temperatures, and potentials, high reaction rates, and ease of separation. But heterogeneous catalysts also sometimes suffer from certain drawbacks, and one of those is product selectivity. And let me give you an example. What I'm showing you right here is the pearl plant in Qatar that takes natural gas, which is mostly methane, and converts it into liquid hydrocarbons. It does this in a multi-step reaction. One of those steps is called the Fischer-Tropsch reaction, which takes carbon monoxide and hydrogen and turns them into liquid hydrocarbons. But in this process, the Fischer-Tropsch reaction converts carbon monoxide and hydrogen to a mixture of final products not a single specific final product, often meaning that significant post-processing is necessary to get to the desired chemicals that you want. Now, one of the nice things about being at RPE, one of the things I love about being at RPE is learning about different fields than the ones you are in. And for me, one of the fields I love learning more about is our biological systems. And one thing that I find truly amazing about biological systems is that with only a handful of elements, including trace amounts of metals, biological systems are able to produce hundreds if not thousands of selective products. A good example is what I'm showing here to the right. An RPE awardee, Lanzatech, can take carbon monoxide and hydrogen, those exact same feedstocks, and convert them using a single organism to 20 different products selectively. And that level of selectivity would be nothing short of astounding in a heterogeneous system. So that got me thinking, how do biological systems um, take these feedstocks and convert them so selectively? And what tools do they use and how can we leverage those in envisioning new types of heterogeneous catalysts? So the first thing you realize when you look at biological reactions is that they occur on multiple different length scales. So they don't just occur at the active site. They also occur at the protein level, the subcellular, and the cellular level. Let's see. Biological reactions occur at all of these different length scales. And like, give, let me give you a few examples of what tools biological systems use at these different length scales to achieve the selectivity that they desire. At the active site level, biological systems often have 
inter- and intramolecular interactions to help guide the reaction. A good example is hexokinase, which takes a hexose, such as glucose, and ATP, and binds these near one another. In fact, it binds the ATP on two different sites. And this allows this protein to phosphorylate the hexose, which is the first step in breaking down that hexose into energy. So how can we envision translating this to a heterogeneous system? Well, we need, we're going to need to, with atomic precision, place each atom that we desire onto this uh, catalyst in such a way that when we subject that catalyst to the oftentimes extremely harsh conditions that we subject heterogeneous catalysts to, they don't move, they don't change in conformation, they don't change in oxidation state. Now, when you zoom a little bit further out and you look at the protein level, you see that oftentimes biological systems modify the local environment around an active site. So they change the concentration of products and reactants. They change the acidity, and they change the hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity near that active site. A good example is superoxide dismutase, which takes superoxide, which is negatively charged O2, and converts it into oxygen. And one of the really amazing things about superoxide dismutase is that for every 10 interactions of this protein with superoxide, a reaction occurs, even though the active site is a tiny fraction of the overall protein. And how does it do this? Well, one of the tools it uses is having a positively charged amino acids surrounding the active site, guiding that superoxide to the active site. So, excitingly, certain heterogeneous catalysts are already starting to look a little bit closer to this. You see um, zeolites often affecting the local concentration of products and reactants, but in order to get to the selectivity that biological systems have, much more precision in the engineering of such structures is necessary. When we zoom even further out to the subcellular and cellular level, we see that biological systems often go through the same intermediate to get to different final product. A good example is acetyl-CoA, which is an intermediate for a whole host of different final products, including vitamins, steroids, and bile salts. So how can we translate some of that knowledge to heterogeneous systems? Well, we can really start thinking about tandem catalysis, which might allow us to break free of the, th of the equilibrium limitations of single reactions. So what I've shown you today is really just a tiny subset of the different tools that biological systems use in order to selectively produce chemicals. And if we can take some of those tools and translate them to heterogeneous catalysts, not only can we envision making selective fuels using heterogeneous catalysts, but we can get even more ambitious and start imagining the creation of designer molecules that are currently unfathomable um, to be created using heterogeneous catalysts becoming possible. What does a catalyst like this look like? Well, I don't know what it does look like, but I do know what it doesn't look like. Just like how we can draw inspiration from birds when designing planes, but have them look nothing alike, so too will these catalysts likely draw inspiration from biological systems, but look nothing like their natural counterparts. And with that, I want to leave you with my email. I love talking about this subject. Please come find me afterwards if you're interested. And I want to pass it on to my colleague Ishik, who, who will wrap this session up. Thank you, Ishik. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, switches on steroids, uh, making gains and grid hardware. All critical infrastructures, water, food, transportation, communications, finance, our economy are ultimately dependent on a functioning electrical grid. Uh, the proposed program will seek solutions to harden the grid component, uh, components against threats as well as hasten the recovery in case of significant damage. Uh, for example, a National Academy study estimates that it would take uh, more than $1 trillion to fully harden the grid against electromagnetic pulse uh, events. There are about 2,500 large power transformers used in the United States grid infrastructure and for the 
purpose of this discussion and, and this presentation, a large power transformer is one defined with a nameplate rating of about 100 megavolt amperes and higher. While widespread outages due to space weather and high altitude electromagnetic pulse events are expected to be uh, low frequency events, the consequences are catastrophic. And uh, there's precedence for, these, for the occurrence of these uh, events. Uh, solar storm events and high altitude electromagnetic pulse are the focus here uh, since uh, for these threats, risk management practices are nascent and critical vulnerabilities exist. High altitude electromagnetic uh, pulse originates, could originate, would originate from a nuclear detonation at altitudes at about 40 kilometers, subjecting large spatial regions to electric fields of the order of tens of kilovolts per meter. An example would be, for example, the uh, Starfish Prime experiment uh, it, it taking place in 1962, a nuclear detonation of, above, the, in the, above the Pacific, uh, damaging uh, the uh, grid hardware in Hawaii, causing outages, and in the meanwhile also damaging the Bell Labs uh, Telstar, uh, world's first communication satellite equipped with silicon devices that were uh, damaged. They, function for another six months or so, but they eventually uh, failed. The proposed program would firstly target har hardening the vulnerable grid components, and secondly look for uh, solutions hastening the recovery. So weather-related um, uh, power outages have increased uh, 50 to 100 uh, events per year. Uh, and this is partially due to the aging of the grid at an annual cost of 18 to 33 billion dollars. Large power transformers carry 90% of the nation's power and with an average age of 40 years, they represent the biggest uh, electric grid vulnerability to space weather and high altitude electromagnetic pulse events. The hazard function that, that, that's shown there is, provides uh, motivation uh, for the pros, uh, proposed program. The root cause of transformer failures comes usually down to shorting between the copper transformer windings, insulation fail, failure of the celluloid material referred to as the craft paper, excessive heating caused by saturated core, uh, breakdown of the transformer oil and leaks. The damages are usually permanent and the damaged uh, transformer needs to be replaced. Earth's magnetic field protects the lower magnetic latitudes against most solar weather events. However, a solar storm of the magnitude of the Carrington event uh, in 1859 now would be devastating. Uh, based on historical observation of aurora displays in lower latitudes, uh, average return period of an extreme solar storm uh, can be estimated. And this turns out to be about 150 years and some error bars on this with plus minus 50 years. In this slide, we look at the, we see uh, we calculation of the geomagnetically induced current flows in and out of transformers and their vulnerability uh, based on assumptions about the Carrington ev effect event, uh, looking at the change in the magnetic field, making some assumptions about uh, center of the, of the, of the event. Uh, clearly, quite some number of transformers are vulnerable and will be uh, permanently damaged. It takes the loss of nine critical transformers to put millions of lives at risk, uh, causing economic losses in the order of uh, trillions of dollars. Uh, partial recovery within two years, uh, full recovery would be about um, 10 years. Uh, within, view, uh, within a few weeks, um, clean water uh, would be um, 
uh, scarce, diseases would be, uh, there would be disease outbreaks. And I think at that point, no one will be uh, mining for Bitcoins, but protecting, uh, protecting the water in their pools. And it's all downhill from there. Um, so this is uh, what happens in a, uh, um, look at the large power transformer capacity risk in a worst case scenario. Uh, it's estimated that about 300 large power transformers will be at risk, mostly in the Washington DC to New York City corridor, uh, including a lot of transformers in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, another region that's at risk would be northern Midwest states such as Wisconsin and Michigan. So why does recovery take so long? It take, can take years because large power transformers are custom built, uh, manufacturing processes are intricate, uh, global production is limited to about 500 units uh, per year. Uh, hence the cycle time for replacement could be as large as two years. Switches refers to a successful power electronics program that ARPA-E funded, exploring, silicon, exploring semiconductor solutions uh, to, to power electronics uh, in the area of power supplies and motor drives. Uh, in the program uh, that we're suggesting uh, switches on stero steroids, we want to target uh, grid applications. And we would approach this by not only uh, semiconductor solutions, um, but with also looking at gas tube switches and reimagining the large power transfer, uh, transformers, which practically have not changed in, uh, since their invention. Um, of course, you have to think of cables, conductors, construction. Size weight uh, reductions are uh, important. Can a 10 hundred fold reduction in size and weight uh, be achieved. Uh, there's a photograph of um, a 250 MVA power transformer, and you can see the size of that. Uh, in the middle is a project funded by ARPA-E, and that's about a 10 MVA um, uh, uh, power flow controller. You can see the size uh, of the mass size and weight of these uh, current solutions. Semiconductors could be an answer, though uh, there are a lot of limitations with respect to uh, uh, resistance losses and, and efficiency of uh, solid state uh, solutions to the transformer problem. Uh, we clearly need much higher voltage uh, breakdown devices with low uh, resistance. Another solution is looking at gas tubes and plasmas uh, to achieve high voltage, high power um, switches, uh, for example. Uh, this is a GE project uh, from Open 2012, and this team has been able to demonstrate 125 kilovolt uh, switching results. Uh, they will, they're um, about to demonstrate a 300 kilovolt operation, uh, and this device has features like self-healing cathodes uh, and um, a very exciting development, but it's very early stage. So can we take something like this out of the lab and, and make transformers out of uh, this concept? And lastly, uh, the transformer was invented uh, in Hungary. Uh, at that time, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian -Hung Empire in 1885, um, and not by Tesla, so let's uh, uh, establish that. And within a year, uh, William Stanley uh, uh, took this uh, toroidal uh, transformer design and made it into something more usable. And, and within one year, uh, he, uh, was, um, he used it for lighting in, in one of uh, the cities in Massachusetts. Uh, and, um, and you can see the evolution of the transformer. They're getting larger, but with respect to the basic concepts, their uh, features, they're uh, very similar. So what does the transformer of year 2050, well, what does, that, what does that look like? So I believe the time is now uh, to imagine 
what that structure is going to look like, uh, how will it will be manufactured. Um, with that, um, the goal of this program would be zero power interruptions by, uh, to the grid by 2050, and these are some of the uh, technologies, possible technologies, uh, to harden the components, but also hasten the recovery. So with that, um, I'd like to um, um, uh, pass the, uh, I guess, the baton. baton to Addison, and I'm happy to discuss uh, uh, this topic with you uh, after the session. Great. So again, the number is up on the screen. Feel free to text questions. We have a few coming in already. Um, and I will go ahead and first turn, since we just heard from Ishik. Uh, what are some of the semiconductor materials do you think that are compatible with this application space? Yeah, that's a very hard question. I, I think um, I showed the example of a state-of-the-art uh, silicon device uh, to even make a 20 kilovolt or a 13 kilovolt medium voltage uh, application, you need to stack three of these devices, uh, and uh, this is, creates a lot of losses, and the uh, efficiency of solid-state transformers doesn't match uh, that of the, um, the traditional transformer. So we have to start, we have to think of gallium nitride, but at very high voltages, beyond 10 kilovolts, and uh, there's a slew of wide band gap semiconductors emerging uh, they possibly could be uh, addressing, uh, addressing that uh, box that I showed. Um, but I think we have to go beyond gallium nitride for grid applications, high voltage. Bottle, what are the possible operating conditions for these bio-inspired catalysis, um, catalysts? Yeah, so, so one of the really difficult things um, from what I presented, and, and I mentioned my background on purpose, is that I recognize that these catalysts are usually operated at extreme uh, conditions. Uh, I'm an electrochemist. When you're operating electrochemical systems, you're actually usually operating them at uh, potentials that are quite significant. We don't really think of that, those as, as harsh conditions because we can stand right outside it and look in, but in the actual cell, these are really high, uh, harsh conditions. Of course, with thermochemical systems, you're operating often at high temperatures and high pressures. So biological systems don't have to operate at those temperatures, pressures, and potentials. And these um, new catalysts, or these proposed catalysts would, would have to have completely different ways of approaching these same tools. Um, and so, yeah, I, mean, I, I think they would have to maintain those. I don't think they could go down to room temperature and pressure. To follow on, follow on yeah. that a little bit, um, can you, so, how do you envision the trade-off between rate and selectivity under this new paradigm? Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to have the best of both worlds here is, is what I'm trying to pitch is, um, is let's have high rates along with um, high selectivity. Biological systems per atom of, of, of metal are, are actually not bad. It's, it's, um, it's the fact that the vast majority of the protein, of course, is not the active site. Um, I think it would really have to be reaction dependent. Um, my guess is if you're making a liquid fuel, you probably want it to operate at pretty high rates. If I'm, make, uh, if I'm making a uh, drug um, for, or a flu vaccine or something like that, you can't really, okay. If you're making a drug, you know, you probably are okay with reducing that um, operation to ensure selectivity, yeah. So Rachel, I think this is in reference to your mentioning uh, high throughput material testing. How big do samples need to be right now for testing and what are the barriers to going to smaller ones? Yeah, so right now the samples, I mean it depends on the material, but you need between five and 10 material crystals, so that doesn't sound that big, but it's five to 10 material crystals that have been somewhat uniformly exposed to the same conditions. So some of the barriers are getting the amount of damage uniformly at that depth in a sample is a little bit hard. Um, and so the small samples where you have only like two crystals, so then the depth that you need to get the damage to is much smaller. 
so you can do that more rapidly. The problem right now is that when you're testing something that's that small, it's mostly that you're testing the grain boundary instead of the bulk property of the material. And so the question is, can you figure out how to translate what the actual bulk materials properties are instead of just testing that individual material grain boundary? And you alluded to controversy in the field in ions versus neutrons and kind of left us hanging. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you see as potential downsides to moving towards ions or upsides? Yeah, um, so there are several research groups that are looking at ion irradiation and they've published some studies. Um, some are very optimistic, some are more pessimistic. And I mean, ions are charged and neutrons aren't. Um, so that's, that's your starting point of like why that might not be a direct analog. Um, and the size of ions varies. Um, so it, it, the thing that is similar is that you get the same kind of uh, patterns of damage, but it's unclear how directly it translates. And so that because of things like ion sizes are different, it's charged versus uncharged. Um, and so there, there are some big questions in the community about can you get sort of the physical damage and use that information and then just use neutrons to sort of finalize some of that investigation? Or does it all have to be neutrons? Um, I haven't heard anybody postulate replacing neutrons entirely, um, but it's, it's how much can you leverage ions and can you, if you use, you know, specific types of ions, can you um, make correlations so that you know what the mapping is so that we can say like, if we always use, um, you know, protons or we always use this spe specific ion, it will map to neutrons like this. And so there are, there are a collection of research groups somewhat actively uh, researching this and unclear, but kind of exciting. There was a question for myself, uh, what reaction could I imagine being, say, a first application for this? And actually, it was reminded, looking at what we'll see Fottle present, is reactions that Fottle didn't get into, but the Fischer-Tropes reaction and other things are also highly thermally um, demanding, so highly exothermic and often coupled with a highly endothermic reaction. So you can imagine things that have a, a lot of heat transfer requirements could really be a place where we could look at applying additive or other advanced manufacturing methods to uh, reactor design where you need to have intimate coupling and designing like a heat exchanger, where we've seen some success um, actually, some of these ideas I've seen came from our ARID program where we've applied a lot of these ideas to uh, thermal device design, heat exchanger design. There's a question for Isik. Um, are there other non-hardware approaches that you can see? So system and, uh, optimization or device optimization configuration approaches besides going after materials? Yes, I think we have to, in the case of the solid state transformer, those are going to be made up of uh, semiconductor transistors or diodes or switches. We have to revisit what the, what the structure of those, uh, the architecture of those devices are going to look like. They could be possibly optically triggered rather than electrically gated. Uh, and we have to look at all those uh, different, uh, we have to be very creative with the, the using the semiconductor materials uh, in the future. Rachel, um, so how do you imagine, so some of these, um, say perhaps additive manufacturing testing approaches, uh, do you have a sense of the ability to be able to additively manufacture these materials or fuel materials? I mean, I think it's really viable. People are investigating how to additively manufacture or specifically fuel, I mean, among many things, but fuels in particular right now. And one of the interesting things, it's a little bit related, I suppose, is how to, there's investigation of how to like really strategically make fuel so that, for example, you could vary the enrichment of uranium inside of the fuel so that you get like exactly optimal fuel burn up. Um, you can have better waste characteristics potentially. Um, so people are looking at additive manufacturing for fuels and really strategic variation, which is part of what leads me to conclude that you could probably make test samples in this way. Fadal, are there any specific tools or platforms that would be useful for biomimetic heterogeneous catalysis? Yeah, so I think when you're think, when I think about these systems, um, what I'm really trying to push is, is making sure that 
we approach heterogeneous catalysts on all these different length scales. So now we really need to start thinking about what tools uh, do we have. So I'm, a lot of my uh, PhD was spectroscopic, uh, using spectroscopic tools um, in two dimensions. So let's, you know, so making sure that we think about these structures in a three-dimensional way, in a way where we're thinking about multiple different length scales, um, you know, so, so a lot of these spectroscopic tools can be reconfigured to work in this way, um, but really stressing the importance of looking at these different length scales, looking at the system in a very, um, I kind of want to say holistic, but I'm not sure if that's the right word. Let's go with it, holistic way, um, so that we see all the different length scales of this system would be, would be my thoughts on the subject matter. Thanks for sharing your thought process. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a bit of a can of worms for you, Rachel, but you probably think about this as you're looking at program development, is the speed of implementation of these new technologies limited by research or regulation? So it, it's a, a combination, really. Um, so regulations are what require that we have such a high burden of proof of uh, what works inside of a nuclear reactor. If you want to put something in a nuclear reactor that is going to see a certain level of neutron damage, it's required that you demonstrate that it can be, um, it can survive that level of neutron damage. And so that's sort of, I mean, that's a regulatory requirement. Um, but the research burden there is, is just, it takes a long time and we don't have that many experimental facilities. Um, so it, it's, that's the burden of proof. Um, one of the things, there are a bunch of potential solutions. Um, one of them is building a new, more test reactors. Um, they're talking about potentially doing that in Idaho. That could help a lot. Um, some of it is maybe we design components to last a shorter amount of time. So maybe instead of having your reactor be 60 years, maybe you replace it every few years. And so then now you dramatically shorten the time, the time of proof. So it, it is a, there's fundamental science that are the real limits, but it's fundamental science that's limited, um, that's limiting in order to meet regulation. We're getting low on time. A couple more questions probably at most. Um, so Ishik, are there other items besides the transformer that are critical that should be considered for redesign or protection in order to harden the grid? So at this point, uh, the transformers, the large transformers, are the ones that, that seem to be the most susceptible and um, uh, I would uh, probably focus on, on those in the, in the program. Um, I need to look at, I need to study what else would be failing, but the transmission lines are, of course, uh, they behave like antennas in these uh, situations. They're also at risk. Question for myself, what do I view, how do I view the readiness of some of these computational methodologies? Um, for example, like topology optimization. This has been an ongoing research field for the past couple of decades, um, really focusing previously in, as I mentioned before, structural materials and uh, structure design. Um, and that, what that really meant was a lot of the methodologies were developed for single physics, for linear solutions of, of stresses and strains and looking at some sort of force equations. However, as we move forward in every layer of another physics in a multi-physics system adds a lot of complexity. And in particular, if you add reactions, you get to a very high non-linearity and stiffness that really has been a challenge for just modeling of these systems and could really pose an, a challenge for doing optimization. So this is an area that I think will require fundamental methodology development, um, a sustained research effort just in methodology uh, development for this space. Um, And then I think probably to go ahead and wrap things up, I have one more for Ishik, just because you were last and you put clearly a lot of ideas into people's minds. Oh no. <laughs> one question is, what about shifting towards micro grids and moving away from large scale structure? Are there still vulnerabilities um, at those scales or does it change fundamentally the physics of the grid? Well, you still need the transmission. So I think uh, uh, the microgrids is going to pr 
protect you locally. So though that's a good solution. Uh, and those um, components can be possibly uh, changed. Uh, and they're probably cheaper, easier to transport. So yes, that's a, that would be a very good solution. But uh, you still have to do, uh, you still need the large power uh, transformers. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone again for coming to join us this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to having conversations. We can't come directly off the stage, but do look for us after we go back, de-mic, things like that. I know we're always open for conversations. So thank you again. Thank you.